Hi, I'm Ashley Appling. I'm the extension agent uh, for Virginia Cooperative Extension in the Culpeper County office. Uh, and I am in Northern Virginia. So we had a couple of people from, we had a couple from Northern Virginia, um, one from one person from Maryland, Vermont, I believe. So all over. So this is very exciting today. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, integrated pest management. That's what IPM stands for, uh, attracting beneficial insects. Um, so we'll be talking about um, some plants that are good for that and uh, some good predatory insects that you want in your garden uh, and give you some, you'll know what they look like next time you're out and about walking in your vegetable garden, as you see on the picture on this slide, or if you're doing other things around your garden. And then scouting is kind of weaved in, in between all those topics. Uh, basically, it's getting out in your garden and not just looking at it from your window. So you're actually getting out there and seeing what the plants are doing, whether that is needs, whether that is if they need watering, uh, they're having insect issues, you can identify those. Maybe it's some kind of disease issue. Uh, we'll be talking about tomatoes in the next upcoming class in uh, April, the end of April. So we'll have all kinds of disease talks for that that time. And uh, I did put my email address in the chat box and you're welcome to, uh, excuse me, you're welcome to email me if you have any other questions or if you'd like a copy of these slides, um, just email me. Uh, someone else joining us. Okay. And uh, question wise, uh, we'll wait till, wait till the end because I really can't see them <laughs> uh, as I'm presenting. So um, let's get started. We'll be talking about asparagus, beets, carrots, lettuce, onions, peas, potatoes, potatoes, and spinach. However you want to pronounce potatoes, of course. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be kind of Virginia specific because that's where I'm located at. Uh, but it is applicable to your other areas that you all are from. Uh, this is the Virginia Hardiness Zone Maps map, and this comes from the uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Virginia Tech uh, Vegetable Gardening uh, publication. Um, so they've split up the different the state into different hardiness zones. Of course, the hardiness zones come from the USDA Hardiness Zone map, uh, but they've also included these handy last spring frost and first frost states. Um, so which really help you determine on when you're going to need to plant your, especially if you're planting from seed or when it is safe to transplant, transplant the vegetable transplants, I should say. Um, so I am located in uh, Culpeper, Virginia, right up here in Northern Virginia. And we are in what's considered zone 7A. Um, so our last spring frost is typically, I would say closer to April 25th. Uh, last May, actually, we had a frost in uh, around Mother's Day, which did a lot of damage. So it is, it can go past that time. Uh, our first fall frost for our area is uh, October 15th. Usually that goes in, I, I would say October 25th would be a little bit closer to the truth. And sometimes we even go into November. Um, so some of y'all might have different experiences with that. As you can see in Virginia, we go up to 5A. Uh, and that's basically, that's pretty, pretty hilly getting towards West Virginia up here. Um, so 7A is where I'm located. That's where most of the work I do is located. And that's where my own vegetable garden bed is located is in uh, zone 7A. Um, so this, the last spring frost date in particular, you can calculate back how many weeks you have to go to start the vegetables. Usually they put it in days on the seed packet if you're looking at that from seedling to transplant that you can actually put outside. Uh, and if you're going to buy them from the garden center or the big box store, you can you should wait until after at least the last spring frost for your area. Uh, of course, that's going to change depending on where you're at. Um, so, so that uh, influences a lot of different things. Uh, especially the planting dates, like I already mentioned. Uh, it won't influence the insect pests too much, especially since we're growing vegetables. Uh, the insect pests, the timing, uh, especially if the insect pest has to come from somewhere else, uh, can kind of 
kind of change the timeline depending on how far north you are. Um, but most of these pests are going to be around here. They're overwintering in your own gardens, uh, somewhere else close to you, as in squash bugs and um, stuff like that. That's where um, not planting the same thing year after year really comes into play. Um, so you can plant maybe squash two years in a row. Then you switch over to tomatoes, peppers, anything in the solanaceous family. Uh, you could even go the route of beans instead of that, some garden beans, some uh, black beans, of course, or something like that. So you just break up the cycle. Uh, and we're not going to talk about that too much in this class. We do have some future classes coming up in April and May that we're going to talk about that more. Um, but that does come into play with integrated pest management a lot. So basically, this is an approach. You're uh, using all the different methods that we're going to talk about today. So you're using um, chemical and control is usually last, last option. You have uh, biological control in there. You have cultural control, mechanical control. So you're trying all these different options, cultural specifically. Uh, in, the, in the case of tomatoes and some other types of vegetables, certain cultivars will have resistances to insects and disease, disease in particular. Um, so they won't be affected quite as much. Um, so, but you're always out there looking around in the garden. Uh, I know most of us don't want to uh, be spraying our vegetable all the time. Uh, squash bugs does squash bugs does throw a wrench into that plant a little bit. Uh, it takes a lot more work to keep on top of them. Uh, you can use different types of, uh, uh, particular, in particular, uh, remake kind of cloths. Um, there's another name for that, which is slipping me right this second. Uh, but basically, you're using that as a barrier. So water and air can still go through this cloth. And you're going to be using, um, you do have to remove it by the time the squash starts flowering, however, because bees have to go in there to pollinate the squash plants. Um, so there's a lot of timing on your part trying to get around that. Uh, in our area of Virginia, it's, um, it's sometimes it's uh, recommended to plant the squash a little bit later, uh, in particular with the squash fine borer. So you're kind of breaking up that, breaking that cycle. Our entomologist down at Virginia Tech actually rec recommends not planting your squash until early June, because uh, the, the first, uh, I guess, flight of the squash fine borer is usually in late May in our area. So you can try to get around them. Uh, by not having any squash on site when they're flying through your garden. Um, so that's some aspects of integrated pest management. Uh, I am going to talk about pest populations a little bit. And uh, of course, we all want to be safe and use uh, cost always comes into play, but I think safety is one of the big things for most people, especially in their own home backyard vegetable garden beds. So identification comes up a lot, uh, especially with all kinds of different diseases, insect pressures. Uh, this isn't a, isn't a vegetable, of course, in this picture. This is a rose, which has really, really bad black spot on the leaves. You can see that by the, as the name implies, the little black spots. Uh, you also see yellowing in the, of the leaf tissue. And uh, this, of course, is a uh, fungal disease. Um, so if a product like uh, in seven, which is an insecticide, would not do anything for control of this um, particular disease. I know this is an extreme example, example, uh, but I didn't that it's just one way to try to picture. I know I like lots of pictures and things too. Uh, it's just one way to get into the mindset of uh, identification should always be your first first thing you do. Uh, that is the maxim, or that's the thing you should always go for first. Um, so abiotic issues, which I'm going to touch on a little bit, comes into play. Abiotic basically means um, uh, maybe it's a deer ran up and scratched off the bark off your tree, or, or a hailstorm came through, or cold temperatures froze your plant. It's something that's not done by a biological agent, such as a disease, or an insect, or a mite pest. Uh, but identification, keep that in mind uh, when you're walking around your garden. Uh, always identify what you have first before you try to find a control measure. Um, so this is an example that I think shows it pretty well. We always talk about pest life cycles, so you can use this for insects. 
You can use this for mites. You could use this for different diseases. Um, all kinds of different aspects you can use this, use these rules in. Um, so you have, uh, and our example here, this is the uh, Western flower thrips. So it can do damage in vegetable garden beds as well. Uh, it can cause a deformed fruit in the case of tomatoes uh, on their feeding damage. So this, this line drawing here is actually showing them a lot larger than they are in person. Uh, they actually kind of look like little orange, um, like someone, like you, you put some salt onto a tabletop or something like that, but they're orange and they run really, really fast. Um, so they're usually found in flowers. Um, that's actually, that's probably, that's, that's actually where they're found most abundantly. Uh, Gerber daisies, if you've ever grown those in your garden, you will more than likely have seen uh, thrips. Um, pollen, pollen is actually a good representation of size too. Thrips are about that size. Uh, so if you ever have Gerber daisies, check them out. You can get a white sheet of paper, put the flower over top, kind of tap it real, tap it lightly. Uh, some pollen will fall, but thrips will fall too, but then they'll be running real fast. They're very quickly, very quick. Um, it's very interesting to see, uh, see them if you've never seen them before <laughs> running around. Uh, and they reproduce very quickly. Um, so as our diagram is going from counterclockwise from the egg to the first instar, that's about one to two days. Uh, second instar stage, two to four. And you can see it's going fast. So they actually drop down to the ground. So we're seeing at the bottom here, it's in the soil or leaf litter. They drop in the, down to the ground to pupate. Uh, and then they come back up as an adult. So 30 to 45 days, that's actually at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if it's warmer than that, if it we're getting towards 90 degrees, they can get all the way down to almost two weeks. Um, so they're going from egg to adult in about two weeks in higher temperature ranges. And of course, we want to do any kind of control measure towards the uh, younger stages, the younger instar stage, so one or instar one or the second instar stage. And uh, that's even if you are gonna use pesticides or insecticides. Uh, you wanna apply them at the younger stage. So you're, that's when you're out there scouting and you're looking around and you're trying to identify these pests and then you did identify it correctly. So you know what to apply. Uh, same with aphids, the younger they are, the easier to control. When we're controlling weedy pests out in the garden, so weeds in the garden, pulling them early when they're young is easier. If you do have to result, resort, resort to herbicide control, uh, that's also better to do it when they're younger. Uh, later in the season, they're kind of rugged and tough and kind of really thick cuticles at that point. And it's gonna take a lot more herbicide to control them at that stage. So uh, younger, the better with all kinds of different things, diseases as well. And that's really important to, uh, I apologize if you're hearing my dog <laughs> sneezing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, younger, the better with all these kinds of different control options. Um, and this can go for the cultural control options or the mechanical control. Mechanical control is actually, maybe in the case of aphids, blasting it off with uh, water from a hose. Um, so it's all kinds of different things like that and it comes into play. So keeping all your options open basically is what we're talking about with integrated pest management. A little tiny bit, a little bit into abiotic versus biotic. So we talked about this a little bit. So biotic organisms, so you could use this for vegetable garden. You can use it for your ornamental beds, your fruit orchards. Um, but basically a biotic pest is a living organism. So the bacteria that might be infecting your plant, the fungi, uh, the insects, which we talked about a little bit already, the mites, the viruses, all considered biotic. Uh, and biotic pests occur in a random pattern. So they're gonna occur very randomly across the garden bed. Uh, abiotic pests in, in a kind of contrast to that actually occur in uniform patterns. So hail damage will affect all different species that the hail fell on. Uh, a disease on a disease on the under, other hand will affect like uh, boxwood or, or uh, holly separately and stuff like that. Or tomatoes will be affected in your vegetable garden and then peppers might not be um, because they're not close, they're, they're related, but they're not closely enough related. Um, so biotic pests will be random. So if you see random patterns in the garden, uh, maybe only tomatoes are being affected, then you know it's, it's more than likely maybe the tomato hornworm that's affecting it 
which we'll talk more about in April, the April class, or maybe different diseases that come into play. Um, so keeping this in mind while you're scouting around your garden, if you see uh, if you see all the leaves are missing on all your vegetable plants, maybe you have a very high deer population or even a rabbit population, they can eat your little greens that we're going to talk about later. Um, so just keep this in mind too when you're scouting out and about. Um, so all the different things that come into play. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, biological control, which we're going to talk about a lot coming up. Cultural controls, getting your soil pH tested. Um, making sure you have the right fertility levels, making sure you have the right um, lime levels. Uh, if your pH is too low, so we typically say the pH of uh, 6.2 to 6.8 is really good for vegetable production. Um, so somewhere in the sixes, if you're in the sevens, usually most vegetables will grow well up to 7.2, 7.5 pH. Um, but learning all that from a soil test. So down here in Virginia, you can go to any extension office and get a soil testing box, which you can send off to Virginia Tech. And they will, uh, yeah, send your results back to you. And you can talk to an extension agent in any of the counties here. And they will, uh, can walk you through it. Uh, mechanical control can include, include uh, tilling the soil, can include manually pulling weeds. Uh, so a lot of physical action, of course, just like the name implies. And then sanitation, using bleach, bleach solutions to clean your equipment. 10% uh, bleach solution is what's usually recommended to a sanitize uh, gardening equipment. And you're not just dipping and going. That's usually five, 10 minutes in the bucket. Um, so having multiple tools on hand um, can be very handy in that case. Um, so different types of cultural control. We already talked about the chlorine leach. So that's the sanitation option. You could use Lysol sprays also. Um, just uh, spray it down till it drips and then let it air dry. So you're not, you're not wiping it off. Um, putting diseased plant material in the taking it, burning it or taking it to the landfill. You don't want to put diseased plants from the previous season in the compost pile. Uh, most backyard compost piles are not getting hot enough to kill uh, weed seeds and uh, different disease pathogens. Um, so sanitation is very, very important with all the different options we're talking about today. Uh, crop rotation, I touched on that a little bit already. So you have, uh, they had the classic plan where you have tomatoes and peppers and potatoes one season, or one year, I mean, in the garden bed. Uh, and then you switch over to, uh, you of course you have your fall crops. Um, so maybe you have your, um, you have your, your have your coal crops that year. So you have your cabbages and your Brussels sprouts and your broccoli. Uh, and then the year after that, you switch more to like beans and squash in that area where you grew the tomatoes the previous year. So you're just trying to break up the pest life cycle. So they're not, so the same plants not in the same spot year after year after year. Um, that's a great way to break up insect pest, pest insect pest pressure or uh, disease pressure in the gardens. That uh, can be a very important uh, strategy in the vegetable garden. Trap cropping can also be used. It's a very handy, uh, handy thing to, to know. A lot of uh, research has gone into this, different universities, uh, Virginia State University and down here near Richmond, Virginia has done a lot of research on this. Um, so different types of pests, like pickle worms prefer squash to cucumbers, so they'll actually usually go towards the squash, so you can kind of play with that. Uh, tomato hornworms, um, when they're in full, full pressure, uh, it's hard to not see them on the tomatoes. Uh, but, uh, and dill, of course, doesn't like growing in the heat of summer, at least in Virginia, very well. Um, so that doesn't always work, but it has been proven uh, by research that tomato hornworms will prefer dill over tomatoes. So that's just something to keep in mind. Harder to implement in that case, of course. Uh, these are what we consider trap crops. Um, so you can, uh, millet has been used in research uh, trials in the, down in Alabama. Uh, so they plant millet in the, in the field. They plant squash, which they're trying to protect. And the squash bugs will actually some of the different pests actually go to the millet, which where they can control it on, uh, and they, they won't touch the squash quite as bad. 
Um, they will eventually. Um, but there's lots of different research has shown different trap cropping like that. Um, so you, maybe you plant a squash variety that doesn't particularly taste that great if you're trying to protect your um, your uh, prime real estate uh, and have most of the squash bugs go there. So you can uh, mechanically control them. I know that's harder to say than do, easier to say than do, I should say. Um, but uh, picking them manually, that's mechanical control. Um, they've, they've shown research of putting like uh, pieces of wood out in the garden at night, at night and the squash bugs will actually go, on, go underneath it. So you can uh, flip it over in the morning and try to control them that way. Um, slug control, they always threw out the, the beer example because the slugs will be attracted to that if you have heavy slug pressure. Uh, deer control is always the one that everyone asks about, uh, and that's usually the hardest one, the hardest pest to control. Um, yeah, it doesn't even matter sometimes how high you, you build that fence, they'll, uh, they still seem to get in there somewhere. <laughs> Just, they can jump straight up. It's crazy to watch deer if you've never seen them jump straight up. Uh, they don't always have to do the running jump. They can jump straight up. That's crazy. Uh, but trap cropping, maybe something to implement. Um, uh, there's lots of research, Virginia State, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sure other universities around the country too. Uh, but something to try, something to try on your own. Harder to do in a small garden. I know I can't in particular do it very well. <laughs> My garden is not very big. Um, so different bi beneficial organisms that you can attract into your garden. Um, so this is planting the different flowers and keeping flowers around your vegetables, kind of intermingling the different plants together. Uh, the classic one, of course, is marigolds. Uh, nasturtium can be used. Um, you just need to have a habitat for these pests to come into play. Planting different perennials will have a list of different plants coming up. Um, having different perennials around your vegetable garden bed can help. Just gives them a habitat to overwinter in. Uh, it's very important for a lot of these predators. Um, so predators, of course, physically consume another pest or insect. Uh, parasites can be, can be a fungal, bacterial. Um, the little uh, parasitic wasps can come into play on this. And they're actually living in and then killing the pest. Uh, pathogens kind of, I think most people are familiar with that. That's microbial, fungal, bacterial pests. Um, there are different funguses that can be um, purchased, uh, can be purchased now that can attack uh, different insect pests. Um, uh, the names are always changing on these products, um, but there are different uh, products you can buy. Uh, herbiv herbivore insects, herbivores can eat, of course, eat weeds, and that's goats, goat control of weeds is a big thing down here. Uh, Virginia State, again, I've done research on that, and you can some goats and they'll clean up your pasture or your vegetable garden area or of course you have to have a lot of room um, if you have a small garden they're just going to eat everything um, but you can uh, you can get a, do a lot of different control mechanisms uh, beneficial organisms um, make them work for you basically kind of thing uh, the habitats growing not growing everything in rows not growing everything separate from the, each other uh, keeping it all in the same spot. Um, so the picture on the right down here, kind of little, but you can see some squash growing up this trellis. Uh, you have other types of uh, squash down here, some tomatoes. So you're planting everything together, basically, and making kind of a, making a habitat. Uh, this is a very nice garden here, but you still see the flowers th throughout. Uh, it looks nice too, but it's also doing work for you, bringing in these beneficial organisms. Um, so just, just keeping perennials and annual plants you want to interweave. Uh, and of course, you can make it look good. So you're just giving them a home to overwinter in. Uh, that's why cleaning up your perennial beds, you should wait until, uh, until spring. So you don't, you don't clean those up in the fall. Uh, the, uh, the old flower, the old flower pods, the old flower stalks uh, are, are overwintering sites for a lot of these predators and beneficial insects. So it's really important to keep that all intact until the tepters warm up enough for them to leave and go somewhere else and do some good work. 
So a few insect profiles, a sassin bug. This is a really good insect to have in your garden. Uh, it feeds on aphids, caterpillars, Colorado potato beetle, which is fantastic if you've run, run into that pressure before. Uh, Mexican bean beetles, a little bit of everything. So you got the different life stages here, the little nymphal stage. Um, you can see it uh, looks pretty similar as it's going along. Here's the egg clusters right here. If you see those on the undersides of leaves uh, and they look like this, don't get rid of them. Um, so assassin bug, this is the adult. Uh, kind of looks scary, but it's doing really good work in your garden. Uh, damsel bug also eats aphids. Uh, a lot of the small leaf hoppers, mites, and caterpillars. Um, so if you see this little bug in your garden, that's a good guy. Uh, you don't, or a good girl, I guess you could say. <laughs> so you don't want to get rid of this insect. It's doing a lot of good work for you. A big eyed bug, uh, kind of like the name implies. It has really big eyes. Uh, and it's eating all kinds of things, aphids, caterpillar eggs, and larva. Um, all kinds of other spider mites, even. Spider mites are really dangerous, uh, uh, especially in your tomato vegetable, tomato beds or other types of uh, gardens like that. Uh, two, -spotted spite, two spotted spider mite in particular is very, very bad. Uh, kind of makes your, uh, they basically suck the juices out of the cells and it kind of makes a lattice-like structure, kind of brown, a lot, of, a lot more brown than there is green left in the leaf. And they'll also even start making webbing over time once their population builds. Um, so having these big eyed bugs in the garden is really important. Um, these guys, these, the, all these bugs we're talking about right here won't really be here there if you're spraying a lot of pesticides in your garden. Uh, they're much more susceptible to the pesticide sprays sometimes than the insects you're actually trying to control. Predatory mites, this is the two spotted spider mite two-spotted spider mite that I was referring to with the two black spots on its back. And this is a little predator mite that's eating these, these spider mites here. Um, so this is, these are good guys to have around. A little bit harder to see, you have to have a hand lens, um, but you can see these actually doing good work. Um, so that's some other predators in the garden. Uh, parasitic wasp, the trichogamma, gamma, gamma <laughs> wasp, <laughs> can never pronounce that one right. Uh, tax eggs of uh, all kinds of things, cutworms, corn worm, corn borers, uh, cabbage moths, which are very handy. Cabbage moths can do a lot of damage to coal crops, as such as cabbages and uh, Brussels sprouts and broccoli, cabbage especially, as the name implies. Uh, army worms, so it does a lot of good work, and they're actually parasitizing the eggs. Uh, and uh, yeah, doing as it says, um, this is a kind of a husk that's left over after the adult has uh, emerged from that egg. So they're doing a lot of good work. Uh, Searfid flies, this actually looks like a bee imitation as the adult right here. Uh, that is a fly, that's not a bee. Uh, it's kind of mimicking a bee. Uh, and this is actually the stage here of the larva that's doing most of the work. So this is what's eating the aphids and the mealybugs. Uh, and the adult's actually more of a pollinator. Um, so if you see either this, the adult stage or the larva stage, uh, that's good to have in your garden. You don't want to get rid of those bugs. Fascinating bug. It does look like a bee. It mimics it very well. Uh, the lady beetles in the garden, ladybugs, some people refer them to. This little alligator-like larva right here, that's what's doing most of the work. Uh, the adults do feed. Uh, but the larva stage does most of the work on the mealybugs, the spider mites, the aphids, all the different soft budding insects. Uh, I know lady beetles are probably the most common, the one you are probably more familiar with, uh, but they're doing a lot of good work in the garden as well. L green lace wings, the adult is very, um, very, very pretty and very graceful, um, but the larva stage, this little Aphid, al aphid lion, I almost said alligator again. Aphid lion is what this referred to. Uh, and this is doing most of the work. This is eating all kinds of different things. Um, so it looks kind of similar to the uh, different coloration, of course, to the lady beetle. Um, but if you see this, that's a good one in the garden. You don't want to get rid of those. Uh, I know this is a very, very long list. Uh, I did put my email in the chat box. So you're welcome to email me if you'd like a copy of these PDFs. Um, but these are just, this is just a snapshot of all the different plants you can plant. 
uh, for to attract these beneficial insects we just mentioned. So we don't really have time today to go depth in depth on all, all these, uh, but I'm always I'm always happy to answer questions if you have a, have one about any any of these particular flowers. And herbs, as you can see, pop up too: coriander, dill. Uh, Mexican sunflower, depending on where you're at, can be, sometimes become kind of weedy, but these are all good annuals to have in your garden. Good perennials to have. A lot of the names are going to pop up uh, that y'all are probably probably very familiar with. The cat mints, of course, coneflower, coreopsis, which is absolutely gorgeous, goldenrod, which is a native to our area in particular, uh, and a lot of the East Coast. A uh, very good pollinator plant. So lots of different options. And this is a few more here. Uh, all the milkweeds, of course, mountain mint, if you've never grown that little bit. It's a native, so we don't always say invasive, but it can get going. Uh, but it's a, if you've never seen a mountain mint in full bloom, it looks like it's moving with a number of honeybees and other types of bees that are on it. Uh, it's amazing how much it attracts into the garden on all different types of uh, of insect life, I guess you could say, to the garden. Um, so we're going to transition to the vegetables. Um, so asparagus is always a really, um, most people want to hear about asparagus. I know I like eating it too. Um, so usually, if you can keep yourself from doing it, you don't want to harvest the first year after you plant the crowns. Um, the second year, you start harvesting a little bit, a little bit, light harvest for the three to four weeks the second year. So that's in the springtime when the, when the spears are coming up. Uh, and you plant the crowns at different depths. Um, so this, this, this is always kind of hard to explain. So I, I did find a video on this that I'm going to show next. I know asparagus always gets the most questions. Uh, Jersey Giant, any, anything that has Jersey in the name of the cultivar name is a very good... Uh, very good asparagus variety to grow. Uh, Rutgers University has done a lot of research on asparagus. So that's where all the Jersey names come from. Um, so we are going to watch this real quick. He explains it's from the University of Maine, um, but he explains it very well on asparagus planting. So uh, we're going to go ahead and watch this. My name is Mark Hutton. I'm the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Vegetable Specialist. And today we're going to talk about planting asparagus. When you make your soil trench to plant the asparagus, you can do it with a shovel, you can do it with a hoe, doesn't really matter. The idea is that you want to have a trench about six to eight inches deep. Planting depth is going to vary depending on the type of soil you're in. If you're in a light sandy soil, you may want to go a little bit deeper. If you're in a heavier soil that tends to hold moisture, we can plant a little bit shallower. Another thing to, to uh, consideration to think about is that shallow planted crowns result in smaller spear diameter. You know, we don't get as large as spears, uh, but they tend to come or emerge and harvest tends to be a little bit earlier in the spring. However, they are also more susceptible to frost damage. Deeper planted crowns are going to give you larger spears, but maturity or when you're going to be cutting spears in the spring might be a little bit later just because we're waiting for the soil to warm up uh, and it's going to take longer for it to warm up down deep. All right so we've made our planting trench and you can see it's fairly wide and it's about eight inches deep. Now your soil test recommendation is going to tell you to put two-thirds of the phosphorus in the root zone uh, when you're getting ready to plant. So we've made our trench and now we're going to add our phosphorus. And this could be something like a triple, super, triple superphosphate. We're just going to scatter this in. And the amount you're going to apply is going to be based on your soil test recommendation. Our asparagus crowns have arrived. Uh, if they arrive before you're ready to plant them, you can store them uh, safely in your refrigerator. Once they arrive, we want to take them out, unroll them, and what we have here 
is a bundle of 10 crowns, and these are the variety Jersey Supreme. Once you have your asparagus, you want to unpack it. So we're going to sort these crowns by size, and you can see as I lay them out, we've got quite a range of sizes. The reason why we want to sort our crowns out based on size is we want to plant similar size crowns closer together. So here's a good example of an asparagus crown. The asparagus plant is, or crown is made up of an underground stem, which is right here, and you can see some of the buds developing. Those are what are going to form the spears next summer. And then the root system. And the root system is composed of two types of roots. These larger fleshy storage roots, which are simply storage organs, and then these smaller feeder roots. And these are the roots, these small feeder roots are the ones that take up nutrients and water. Before you plant your crowns, one of the things you're going to want to do is check a few of your crowns and just cut this storage root. And if you see, these are bright and white, indicating that they're very, very healthy. If we were to cut them and they appeared brown or discolored, that would be a good indication that this crown is already suffering or has a, a low level of fusarium uh, infection. Fusarium is a soil-borne disease which eventually is going to lead to the decline of your asparagus planting. All right, so now it's time to start planting our asparagus. So we're going to begin by just laying our crowns out. And we want to have our fur wide enough that we can uh, comfortably spread out the roots without a lot of uh, interference with the sides of the trench. And we're going to space our crowns about a foot apart. Now there's a couple of ways you can go with covering these crowns. If you look at some of the older information, uh, they talk about adding about one to two inches of soil when you first start to cover them. So the choice is yours. You can either cover them all at one time or do it inch or two at a time every couple of weeks. So in this case, we're just going to cover them. Now the other thing I'm going to do is mark where the head of the row is because it's going to take a week or two or more before we start to see spears start to emerge. Yeah, I thought that was, uh, since we're actually not doing this class in person, I thought that would be very helpful. Um, asparagus planting. I know we always get a lot of questions about that. So hopefully that was uh, helpful. And you can use organic phosphorus sources too. You don't have to always go with the inorganic options. Uh, always follow your soil test though to determine how much, what the, what, how the amount of nutrients you need to add to your soils. Um, for beets, um, especially in our area down here, uh, you might be a week or, week or too late, but beets right, planting right now is fine. Uh, it all depends on where you're located right now. Uh, you could do another, another planting of beets in the fall. Um, so a sunny location, uh, a loamy soil is not always available on your site. So uh, it really depends on your soil type, uh, but well-drained is important. So you don't want water standing there constantly. Uh, and you see the pH range, it's basically what I mentioned earlier, uh, six to seven. Cool temperatures, um, so that's uh, daytime temperature can go up. You want at least 55 plus uh, soil degree Fahrenheit temperature in the soil. Um, so then you can plant your seeds directly in the soil. Uh, and well-drained is really, really important with these. Um, so seeds about half inch deep. So our seeds are not, not tiny, but they are kind of small. Uh, space two to three inches apart. And uh, you're basically waiting until, it, they, sometimes they call it like the little shoulders pop up and you see the same thing with radishes. Um, so you can always test it. 
So it's usually two to three weeks after planting. It really depends on weather conditions. Uh, sometimes it can take up to a month or more. But you can do tests, just pull test, uh, test plants, basically, like you would with radishes. And uh, beets are, you can eat the greens too. So beets are absolutely, uh, have kind of an earthy taste, but they are really, really pretty and really tasty to eat uh, in, in, your, in your kitchen. Um, so plant them a little closer if you're just growing it for the greens. Uh, high temperatures is something to keep in mind. It can turn them very bitter. Uh, so this is from seed to plant. Um, I've seen them come in a little bit quicker than that 45 to 80 days, but it really depends on the cultivar. So I would say about a month, month and a half estimate when you start, look, when you start looking in your garden for whether or not they're ready to harvest. And always make sure to read the dates on your seed packets. So you might have beet, beet varieties that take a little bit longer uh, to, to mature. Uh, Ruby Queen are cultivars that Virginia Tech recommends down here in Virginia. Uh, probably up y'all's, wherever you're at too, it'd be a good cultivar in Detroit Dark Red. Uh, two old time cultivars that are very handy to grow in your garden. Uh, carrots need well-drained soil. Um, rock free is very important unless you just, unless you don't mind uh, branching carrots. Uh, if they hit a rock, they'll usually branch around it. So you won't get the straight carrots like you buy in the grocery store. Uh, might be an option to grow them in uh, whiskey type barrels on your, on your, uh, in a pot. So you can get uh, longer carrots. So you can buy different varieties of carrots and some of them are short and some of them are long. Uh, might be an option to grow in a potting soil instead of in the ground. Uh, so you sow the, sow the seed about quarter inch to half inch deep, uh, space the seed about half inch apart in rows, uh, about 12 to eight in, 18 inches apart. So you can kind of estimate that depending on how much room you have. And uh, it's going to take a, take a while. Um, if you, if you plant them a little bit closer, you thin them, thin them when they're about one inch high. Uh, and then you uh, just let them keep going. And uh, usually they're going to, the seed packet, of course, will tell you the maturity date. Um, but they're going to be similar to beets. So it really depends on the cultivar that you pick. Um, but you do want to, as you're getting towards the end of your estimate, you do want to back off from the water if possible. Um, too much water at maturity can can, uh, start, can uh, crack your carrots. Um, so finger type cultivars, three to four inches, short two to four. Uh, half long cultivars grow to five to six inches. Uh, standard like you get in the store usually would be seven to nine. Uh, and if you're planting it in the fall, at least here in Virginia, probably other parts of their country, uh, you can't even leave them in, in the ground in the winter and dig as needed. Uh, of course, if your ground freezes real hard, then uh, that's not an option. But uh, down here, the ground usually doesn't freeze too much in the winter time. Uh, I think then, yeah, different types of cold, the carrots. Purple ones and the yellow ones are always fun uh, since we don't uh, typically grow those, buy those in the grocery store. So there's tons of different cultivars of carrots. Um, that you can grow. Uh, lettuces, one of the easiest plants if you've never tried to grow this, this vegetable in your garden. Uh, you can actually, if you want to, if you're interested in breeding, breeding vegetables, this is probably the one to start with. Um, you can um, let them flower, collect the seed, or you could even let the seed fall and uh, grow year after year. Um, so you can, you can get different cultivars of lettuce, um, your backyard lettuce cultivar, you could name it after a time, as long as you keep track of what the parents were called. Uh, and lettuce is actually pretty easy to uh, breed and breed like that. Um, so you can just let it uh, open pollination breeding. Basically, you're just letting the, the wind and the, the bees and all the different insects do the work for you. Uh, very rewarding plant. I know I like growing lettuce in the garden. I usually grow them a little bit closer together because I just cut it as leaf lettuce. Uh, you can usually get three or four cuttings uh, depending on down here. It's really the summer heat that really pushes us out of range for lettuce production. Um, so you can harvest lettuce a lot faster than the other two root crops we were just mentioning. 
uh, is if you're going for leaf lettuce anyway, you're just cutting it like they would uh, young leafy greens in the grocery store when you buy those. Um, lettuce, the only thing, I, uh, aphid, aphids are what I would want to look out for that for them. Uh, they're usually little green insects, uh, not real big, but they can be a pretty big pest on lettuce. You just have to wash them off, of course. Um, so if you're going for the full head, head of lettuce, it's going to take longer, uh, depending on cultivar, 40 to 80 days. Um, and you just keep on going with that. So butter crunch is a good bib type. Dark green Boston is a good loose head type. Uh, and the other types that are on here too. Um, really good cultivars. Um, Black Simpson is a really good old fashioned cultivar that you could try too. And there's always new ones too. Hey, Ray. Oh, please mute yourself if you're unmuted. Different types of lettuce that are coming up here. There's some pictures. Leaf lettuce is what I usually grow. Onions, there's long day types. Um, take 15 to 16 hours of daylight uh, to set bulbs. So that's the trigger. Uh, and that's usually in the northern summers. Uh, short day types are usually used in the south, and they, don't, they require 12 hours of daylight uh, to set bulbs. Uh, seed of short day varieties, you can start indoors uh, January down here. Uh, and they'll usually produce the harvest in June. Uh, if you're going to grow one of the long day types, you can put out seedlings or sets of those long day varieties in April in our area in Virginia. And I usually harvest, harvest those in August. Um, so you just have to play around with the dates depending on where you're at. Uh, onions are always fascinating. Garlic is too. We're not talking about garlic this class, but um, there's so many different uh, types and cultivars. It's just fascinating. Um, so you can buy sets, of course. You can grow your own from seed, just like we mentioned on the last slide. Uh, seeds need to be started indoors eight weeks before setting out. So you have to, do cal you have to calculate back. Um, usually the, uh, the frost date, you play around with that, your last frost date in the spring. And uh, green onions, when the tops are six, inch six inches tall, is when you harvest those. Um, so it really always check the, harf the maturity date on, on the package where you're buying the onions from. Uh, cult different cultivars have different dates, just like we mentioned for the other vegetables tonight. White Portugal is a very good cultivar for, for our area in Virginia. Uh, peas, we've actually missed the window a little bit down here in Virginia. Um, you could still try them. I planted some last weekend. Uh, two to three weeks ago is when most people were out there planting peas in this part of Virginia. Uh, sunny site, you could also plant another crop in the fall. Uh, sow, the, sow them two inches apart, two inches deep, three to five feet between the rows. Uh, you need a support. So if you're going to be growing green beans in the summertime, you could use the supports interchangeably, especially for the runner type beans. Uh, pick the pods and the peas are swollen to a large, large size. You, uh, the snow peas, my favorite type of pea, you can just see them pod in the all. Uh, some cultivars, you can get all different stages. So you could eat, get them, wait till they fully fill out or you're just getting eating the peas themselves, or you can harvest them when they're a little bit younger uh, and eat the pod and all. So it really depends on the cultivar you buy with peas. Uh, so peas in the pod, <laughs> all the different types here. Uh, and if, if you haven't taken the chance to admire pea flowers, pea flowers are absolutely gorgeous. So um, I just, one of my favorite spring flowers. So uh, if you haven't given peas a try, go ahead and give them a try. Uh, potatoes right now. Um, some people around our area try to plant them a little bit earlier, but you could always get them frozen. So uh, uh, late freezes uh, can um, damage the tops. They'll usually grow back, but sometimes they can set them back depending on how hard the freeze was. Um, Well-drained soil, you see that pop up a lot. Uh, and uniform moisture, um, that's always thrown around for a lot of vegetables, but uh, you don't want the potatoes wilting a lot is the main takeaway from that. 
Um, so we'll have a picture of the seed pieces on the next slide. Uh, they call them potato seeds, but they're not really. Uh, you cut the, uh, you have your potato, you cut it into sections. They have to have one growing point, little eyes on the potato. Uh, and that's what you actually plant. Um, so you, and you space them 10 to 12 inches apart. Light frost they'll take, not a heavy frost. Uh, so there's different cultivar types, early, medium, and late varieties. So you just have to stagger, uh, know how long it's going to take to mature. And uh, the picture here, you cut them into sections. So you have your potato, of course, and you just need eyes on the potato pieces. Uh, and this is what they call seeds for potato seeds. This is what you will buy. Uh, Pontiac, Steuben, Superior, and Yukon Gold grow down, grow well here. Uh, you can see the maturity range is 100 to 120 days. Um, so just calculating that out will give you the harvest date. Uh, and you can get all different colors when you buy them, uh, buy the potato seeds. It's really fascinating and uh, pretty cool. And then uh, finishing us off for tonight, uh, spinach. Spinach isn't the easiest vegetable to grow. Uh, it does bolt very easily and bolting is what they refer to as flowering. Um, some of the, the lettuce would be a lot, something I would try before the spinach. Uh, but if you want to try it, uh, 40 to 70 days to maturity. Um, harvest the plant when it produces 68 leaves, six to eight leaves. Uh, but the flower stalk is always going to be coming. So you have to watch out for that. Uh, it will bolt fast. Um, so it's, um, that's one of the drawbacks of spinach. Will tolerate some shade. I did not mention that with the lettuce, but lettuce will as well. Uh, and uh, you can see well-drained soil. You don't want water sitting for any of these vegetable, vegetable varieties. Um, so sow the seed a half inch deep. Um, you can fall, a fall crop would probably be a little bit easier. And um, we saw the maturity date earlier. Melody, savory hybrid, um, different little cultivar selections. Um, I would try, try, try those and see which work, what work for your area. Um, can be very tricky, like I've already mentioned, to grow spinach. So a lot of trial and error, I would think, I think in that regard. Um, so we did finish on time. So I'm gonna answer, uh, look through the chat box and see what kind of questions y'all have. Um, and here's my contact here. So let's see. Yes, I can. Yeah, the, the email is on the screen right this second. If I move this box, I think y'all might be able to see that box right now. <laughs> Zoom is not great in that regard. <laughs> it does have a lot of these floaty boxes sometimes. Yes, I will be uh, sharing the slides, yes. Any questions other than that? Um, I, know, I know the April class will probably be a lot more exciting. I know we, most people want to hear about tomatoes especially, um, but asparagus is exciting too. Asparagus is one of my favorite vegetables. So um, since we didn't have an in-person class, I did want to at least show you all um, an actual planting of asparagus. So. Uh, growing in containers is actually not too different than in the ground. Um, you do have a lot more water pressure, Donna, than you would in the ground. Uh, you have to water more often. Um, if you're gonna, if you're talking about growing tomatoes in containers, we will talk about that in the April class. Um, growing a tomato, um, you need at least uh, at least a half barrel size, um, whether it's plastic barrel or or wooden barrel to grow one tomato. Five gallon bucket is the one most popular thing on the internet or on the on the gardening shows. Uh, but uh, just keep in mind, you're going to have to water a lot. Yeah, so we'll, we will get we will go back into uh, we will talk about that more specifically then. Oh, asparagus, you can get uh, you can get online from different stores. Um, even the ones you find at the big box stores, asparagus, that will usually grow well. It's mostly cultivar selection you want to look out for with asparagus. Uh, any of the Jersey types is really good. Uh, purple passion, if you want a purple asparagus, is really nice. 
Uh, you just want to stay away from uh, the old time cultivars like Mary Washington and other types like that. Um, but um, I think uh, I think southern seed exposure grow sales asparagus crowns down here in Virginia. Uh, I haven't looked in a long time though, so don't quote me on that. Um, but you're mostly looking out for cultivar selection when it comes in come when it comes in the when it comes with asparagus. So. Uh, it depends on how peas are usually very hardy. So it really depends on um, how cold we're talking, Karen. <laughs> if you're talking about the low 20s teens, then I would be kind of worried. Um, uh, peas, peas low 30s, I wouldn't be worried too much at all. Uh, hybrid versus heirloom, and you can always cover them as long as the plants aren't too big, Karen. That's always an option with a sheet or something like that. Hybrid versus heirloom. Uh, heirloom are uh, open, open pollinated varieties of vegetables that have been um, usually old time varieties like uh, tomato heirlooms are always the classic example. Um, so those are open, open, open pollinated basically. Um, so they're, uh, they are bred by the companies, but they're, uh, they date back, they go back a long time and the companies have to keep them true. Um, but they're, uh, if you plant the seed of an heirloom, it'll come, it'll come true for you too. So uh, you can plant heirloom seeds and keep them, you can keep them in your own garden and plant them year after year. Hybrids, a uh, little bit more tricky. Uh, they will not come true from the seed usually. Um, so you'll get one of the parents, which might not be a good thing. It might be a, might be a good thing, might not be a bad thing. Um, but hybrids usually do have a lot more disease resistance. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, basically, you can you can keep heirloom seeds year after year, and hybrid seeds you have to buy from the company. So uh, that's two ways of looking at it, also. Oh, and I didn't put my yeah. The contact is on here, but I'll put it in the chat box too. Oh, in regards to cucumbers, we are, we're going to talk about that more next week, but uh, next month, I mean, but uh, they're, they're very closely related to squash. Uh, it's not separate plants. It's, uh, uh, they're separate male and female flowers on the same plant. So the same thing, same thing goes with squash. Um, so in the case of cucumber, there'll be a little tiny little cucumber behind the flower. Uh, in the case of squash, there's a little squash. Uh, and they both have to be pollinated by bees. So uh, there's not separate plants. There's separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Um, so, and the male flowers usually open up first. So when we get calls of, uh, we get calls from people saying that all their flowers fell off, uh, it's usually because they were male flowers and you weren't gonna get fruit from them anyway. Um, so the female flowers usually come later. So it's, sep it's male and female flowers on the same plant. Any other questions? Uh, I'm glad, I'm, gl I'm very happy y'all joined us tonight. So I think we got into the 20 range participants, which is fantastic. Eggplant, no. Uh, eggplants in the same family as tomatoes and peppers. Uh, are losing flowers, probably some environmental issue. Um, if eggplants dry down, they will dry down too much and have too much uh, moisture fluctuations, they'll lose flowers. Um, Eggplant, uh, they have more of a, tr a perfect, uh, more of a true flower. So they have male and female parts in the same flowers. Um, more than likely, they plant some kind of environmental issue. Um, myself, and I know most of our master gardeners down here, here in Virginia in our local area, most of us don't have really good luck with eggplant. <laughs> um, flea beetles is a very big pest of eggplant. Uh, something to look out for. Um, so there's just all kinds of issues and Personally, I've never had a lot of luck with eggplant, so very tricky, tricky vegetable. Oh, you're welcome, Laura. I'm happy you joined tonight. Any other questions? Uh, right, we're right at seven, so I'm going to sign off if there's no more questions. In uh, the recording, if you'd like to watch the recording, I did record it tonight. It'll be available probably not until late later this week, maybe early next week, but it'll be available on our um, 
uh, the Culpeper Extension Office has its own YouTube channel. Um, so uh, I can, uh, it'll be on there once once we're done, once, once it's up anyway. <laughs> and I think I saw somebody, yeah, it's lost in the chat box. Um, anybody who did want to copy of the presentation, please, please email me directly and I'll, I'll send you a PDF copy. Because I think someone put their email in the chat box and I can't find it now. That's the bad thing about the chat box. <laughs> the, the messages get lost. Okay, everyone. Um, hope, hopefully you will join us in for the April class. Uh, each class is a uh, separate registration. So um, if you haven't signed up for the April class yet, please do that. Uh, it was on our flyer, just like the, this class was. And if you can't find it, just email me about that as well. But you do have to sign up separately. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoy the weather. I know down here in Virginia, it's going to rain, rain tomorrow, So, uh, which is a good thing. But um, yeah, uh, hope you all have a great evening and uh, hope to see you again in April.